Good morning, Kenoy. It sounds like we are awake this morning. Awesome. Well, let's stand up and let's worship. <clears throat> As cruel as a grave Shame is a robber And he's come to take my name Love is my redeemer Lifting me up from the ground Love is the power Where my freedom song is found Ain't no grave Sound. I'm gonna rise up out of the ground There ain't no He went on down to hell He took back every key He rose up as a lion Now he's setting all the captives free There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body I'm gonna rise up out of the ground There ain't no grave You hold my body down There ain't no If 
You ran out of the grave I'm running to If you ran out of the grave I'm running to If you ran out of the grave I'm running to If you ran out of the grave I'm running to If you ran out of the grave I'm running to you ran out of the grave I'm running to If you ran out of the grave I'm running to If you ran out of the grave I'm running to Let's declare this this morning If you ran out of the grave I'm running to If you ran out of the grave I'm running to Thank you Jesus if you ran out of the grave, I'm running to. If you ran out of the grave, I'm running to. There ain't no grave. There ain't no grave. Can hold my body down. There ain't no grave. Sound. I'm gonna rise without the ground. There ain't no grave. There ain't no grave. Hold my body down. There ain't no grave. Can hold my body down. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to church this morning. Whether you're here in person or online, we are so glad you're here. My name is Nick, and I'm really happy to be here with you guys this morning. I have a few announcements. Actually, I have more than a few. I have like five announcements for you this morning, so hold on tight. Here we go. There's an online Bible study that we're doing. It's open to be signed up for right now. And uh, we've been trying to do some online Bible studies as a way to help uh, some of our folks who meet in person, meet some of our folks who meet online. You're welcome to email me, nick at kanoi.org, to sign up. We're going to be doing it on Wednesdays during our lunch break, so around noon. So if you're working, you have your lunch break, it's a good half hour to 40 minute Bible study just to get into the Word together. So if you're interested, please email me to sign up. Fall Fest is coming up in just a couple weeks, October 24th. It's from noon to five. It's gonna be an awesome community outreach time. We need food and drink items, baked goods, craft items, and many volunteers. So if you're interested in jumping in in one of those ways to help serve, go to the Welcome Center and there's a sign up sheet back there. Just add your name to that sheet. This coming weekend on Saturday is Be the Church Saturday. Normally the way that the Be the Church event works in E-Town when all the churches come together and we do some projects for the borough, like weeding or mulching the fun fort or mulching at the train station, just a way to love our, our community. Uh, usually that happens on a Sunday. We do that and then we meet back for some worship together with all the churches together. Because of COVID, that event got canceled. This is the reschedule that it's on Saturday all you got to do is show up at the E-Town Park at noon and you can join a project if you'd like to do that and then around three o'clock they have a bunch of food trucks that are coming to the park and you can have dinner with other people there since uh, COVID started one of the things that our church did was we adopted the whistle stop apartment building in Elizabethtown there's a bunch of seniors that live there and one of the things that we were trying to do to care for and love on them in a very tangible way was to make sure that they had groceries, especially at the height of the quarantine when going to the grocery store wasn't an option, when people were supposed to stay inside. And some of these people, they don't even have transportation anyway. 
And so what we were doing was we were showing up and bringing them groceries, food boxes. We're still doing that. And we've kind of backed off on that a little bit, so now it's once a month because they're able to get out and get their own stuff. So once a month, we're still doing that. It's every second Wednesday. Now, here's what we would love to see. We'd love to see more of our church get involved with this ministry. It's a really great, tangible way to share Jesus' love with the community around you. And so what we need is we need people who will donate food, canned food items, maybe it's cereal, maybe it's uh, ramen noodles, you name it. We need food, then we need folks to show up that second Wednesday and help pack the boxes. And we also need folks to help go and deliver them because we go and we knock on every apartment door, we drop off a box of food, we say hi. Again, it's a great experience. So we're looking for some more volunteers. So if you wanna jump in there, please, uh, you can call Stacy Wagner and her number is in the bulletin. Uh, and now, the other thing I want to make sure you guys know is that communion's coming up on October 25th, so the last Sunday of this month. And the reason I'm reminding you is because, one, communion's a little different right now. Rather than passing a plate like we've, we've done in the past, we'll be doing it by setting out a prepackaged communion on each chair. So when you come in, you have just yours that has only been touched by you. And then for folks who are joining us online at home, we want you to know when communion is so that you can prepare by having uh, bread and juice or, or whatever you guys, crackers, or whatever you want to use at home. You can have that prepared for our Sunday service on October 25th. That's all I have. So I'm going to turn it back over to the worship team and invite you guys to stand up.
Jesus. We can live in the peace of knowing that you are always there. That you will not leave us. You will not forsake us. You reign above every other power. You reign above every other principality. You are forever. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's sing that again. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.
God from whom all blessings flow. Thank you, Jesus. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye. Heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're here. With the grace of the Savior, with the heart of the Father, you're all we need. You're here with the hands of the healer, with the power of your spirit, you're all we need. You're here with the grace of the Savior, with the heart of the Father, you're all we need. You're here with the hands of the healer, with the power of your spirit, you're all we need. of your name every chain will break I know everything will change Jesus just the whisper of your name will silence wind and wave at the mention of provider all I've ever needed 
going to be talking about today is fear. When I was your age, I had a lot of fears. I was scared of thunderstorms and heights and even going in the swimming pool. These fears were so big that I let them stop me from going on some pretty fun adventures. One time, one of my friends invited me to their birthday party. I was so excited to go because I knew all of my friends from school would be there. When I got the party invitation, I saw that it wasn't just a regular birthday party, but it was a pool party. I was so scared to go in the pool that I decided to stay home and not go to the pool party. I missed out on having a fun time with my friends because of my fear. The truth is that even now that I'm older, I still have fears. We all have them. Think of a fear that you've had or maybe you still do have. Has this fear ever stood in the way of something great? Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When we have God by our side, we have nothing to fear. Our God is powerful and strong and can handle any fear that we may have, big or small. The next time you have a fear that you feel you will never be able to overcome, talk to God about it. Pray and remember that because He's with you, you have nothing to fear. All right, good morning. This brings us to our segment of God at work. How is God at work in my life? Well, I know I'm in peace of work. God has his hands full with me, but uh, he's, <laughs> but he's done a lot in my life. And there's times where I had to sit back and reflect to the things he's done in my life. And I like to sit back and I, and I look at where I've come from, or things I have done. Younger would never see me in front of a church doing anything like this, but he's used me through so many things 
and reflecting on what he has done in my life is amazing. He had me teaching Sunday school classes at one time, teaching youth, to using me at a point where I'm actually giving a message on a Sunday morning. Never would have saw, thought that in my life, but God's doing amazing things in me. We just did this online Bible study called The Art of Neighboring. Some of you might have been a part of that. It was really, really good. And God worked in my life this past week. I have a neighbor who's struggling. He's 86 years old, lives in his own home. He walks over and gets his mail along a busy road. I seen him walking. He stumbles. He actually fell this week and landed against his mailbox. I says, it's time to be a good neighbor and be the art of neighboring and go out and help him. So I went out and visited with him. He's from the Ukraine. He has no family here. He has no kids. So he needs somebody to look after him. I asked him if I could get him a walker. And he says, yes. And he's usually pretty stubborn in his ways, but he said, yes. So I got him a walker yesterday and put a pouch on it, gets his mail in, and he made that trip back home very safe. That was God using me to be his neighbor. After I got thinking about it, I decided I want to go to my neighbor's homes. And I want to knock on their door and say, this gentleman lives alone. Is there any way that we can help him together? So I got neighbors who are willing to bring him meals. I got neighbors who are willing just to stop over and and check on him and say hi to him. That's God using me and using them. So I just want to say thanks thanks to God for, for using me and continue to work in my life. So this brings us to our our community prayer time and our tithing part. I want to thank you all for, for tithing. You guys have been great through this pandemic. It's been awesome. We were able to get our debt coming down really low with it also, so thank you all for that. Um, community prayer time, I want to ask you to do a little favor for me. My wife has been very, very ill lately. She's been diagnosed with lupus and she's been really, really struggling. She's very weak right now. Her blood levels are really bad. Her kidney levels are up really high. And it, it takes a toll on me. It takes a toll on the family. But I want to ask you if you guys would, would pray with me, uh, if you guys put your hands out towards her and just lift her up in prayer today. So I'm going to pray for her today. So thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for the things that you do in my life, the things you're doing in my wife's life. She's an amazing person. And for her to be down like this, this is so hard for her. But I just ask you that you would just fill her Fill her with your spirit. Fill her with your love. Comfort her right now, Father. Strengthen me also to be a good husband through all this. But I just ask that you just touch her and heal her and bring her blood levels up and, and have her kidney levels drop, Father. I just know you can do amazing things through her right now. I just ask for your blessings over her. And thank you for all these people here that just support us and online. I thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you, Father. We ask this in your glorious name. Amen. Let's stand up.
gas cans eventually. There's no smoking in the sanctuary today. Just want you to know that. <laughs> Joking, obviously. Um, it's so good to be with you guys today. I, I love that song, that last song we sang. such a good song. And just life, whether it seems like it is for us or against us, the fact that we can praise his name is, some, is a gift to us. Uh, we are still in our series on following Jesus. And I, I want to do a recap. Each week I've been doing a recap, and I just want to remind you where we've been so you don't forget where we've been. It kind of leads us to where we're going. Uh, we're in our sixth week this week, and we're coming to the home stretch, so we're almost to the end. Week one, we said we've got to make sure our priorities are right in following Jesus. If we're only in this thing for the good stuff, then when life is hard, when circumstances are not good, when we have hard teaching, well, our faith probably won't survive that, Right? Um, week two, we said, we can't just preach the grace of God. We have to also remind one another 
that in the midst of grace, grace is a wonderful thing, it's an incredible thing, it's a thing that we don't even deserve, but in the midst of that, there are things in our lives we have to change. That's called repentance. When you're going one direction and you make an about face and you go the opposite direction, that is repentance. And it's important that we are reminded there are things in our lives that we all need to change in order to glorify God. Week three, we talked about intimacy. We talked about two, two words, two Hebrew words, yada and shakab. And yada was this mutual knowing, to know God and for God to know you, an intimate relationship. And that's the relationship that we want. Week four, we said that there is a race for your affection, for your heart, for your love of God. And God doesn't want there to be anyone else on the racetrack. He wants to be number one. There's not even a second place. Anything that gets between us and God is an idol. Even if that thing might be a good thing, like a job. A job is a good thing. But if that job gets between me and God, then it's a not good thing, right? So we want to say no to the things that are idols in our lives. We want to say no so hard that it's possible it looks like we hate those things because we love God so much. And that's not a commentary on hating anything. It's a commentary on how deep our love for God should be. And last week, we talked about how it's important for us to aim at the right target, right? We talked about how it's possible to do all the right stuff, say the right things, act the right way, but be aiming at the wrong target. And it's possible to end up being a hypocrite. We put on a mask, pretend we have it all together, but we're aiming at the wrong target this whole time. This week we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, but before we get there, um, I wanted to, to share, so iron sharpens iron is a proverb, right? And essentially what that means is that you and I sharpen one another. Uh, And every week, you know, I give a sermon, and during the week I'll get a message from somebody or an email from somebody or a phone call. They'll have some questions or they want to talk more. And uh, a question arose a few weeks back from somebody that was watching online. And they said, you know, they they listened to that sermon, and they walked away feeling kind of depressed. Kind of like maybe I was saying that it's possible that if you're a new Christian, you're not doing enough. And I want to make a clarification this morning that if you heard that, if any of you heard that in person or anybody else heard that online, I'm very sorry. I need to sharpen up my communication. In no way, shape, or form do I want anyone to think that if they are recently born again, and if you've been born again, what, you're a baby, right? If you're a baby Christian, if you're a new Christian, I don't want you to think that I'm telling you in this series, you're not doing enough. We're talking about being a follower or being a fan. A fan sits on the sideline and likes the idea of following God. Follower is somebody who actually follows God. If you're a new Christian, you've taken that step. You are following God. You've taken the step to believing in him, to calling on him, to building a relationship with him. You are a follower. And we're all called to continue taking steps. Our relationship with Jesus is one where we know and grow. We know and grow, right? And that's all we're saying in this series. It's totally possible that you've been in a relationship with God for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, two years, and you've gotten a little lazy, right? Sitting on the couch when maybe you should have gotten up. And that's all we're saying. If you're sitting on the couch, let's get up. Let's follow Jesus together. Don't get lazy in your faith, right? That's what we're saying. So if you're a new Christian, I am so excited for you. And there is an awesome road ahead of you. And there are things we're going to talk about in these sermons that totally make sense and apply. And there are some things that are going to be more geared toward people who've been in a lifelong relationship. But I don't want your relationship to get stale. Just like if you've been married for two months, your relationship looks different than if you've been married for 50 years. Hopefully if you've been married for 50 years, you're still getting to know your partner. You are still dating that person. You're still being romantic with that person. You're still making sure they know how much you love them, right? Hopefully. But it's possible that you get married and you're married for so long that you don't do those things, right? You get a little lazy, sort of take advantage of the relationship. You're not pouring in the time and the energy that you should. It's totally possible. That's what we're warning against with the series. Don't let that be true of your relationship with God. Keep dating him. Keep wooing him. Let him woo you, all right? All right, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. 
I say that, and some people are probably excited, right? Woo, Holy Spirit. And some people, a little nervous, like, oh boy, what are we going to do? Is Nick going to make us jump up and wave our arms, or what's he going to do? Don't worry. I think a lot of times we just don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. It's that member of the Trinity that we don't really understand, right? You got the Father. You know what a father is. Maybe you have a father. Maybe you are a father. Maybe you watched a movie where there's a father. You get the concept of what a father is supposed to be. The father, you got the son. Well, we're all children of someone. We know what it's like to be a son or a daughter. We know what it's like to be a child. We, We get what that is. Father, son. Then you get to that Holy Spirit. And you're like, what in the world is that? Is that like the weird uncle? Like, what are you supposed to do with the Holy Spirit? I have a friend who was telling me that one time they were at a family reunion, and his uncle was sitting there, and uh, his uncle's a little strange. But his uncle felt like he wasn't getting the attention that he should get. So he got up, and he left the couch, walked out of the room. He was gone for five or ten minutes. When he came back, he was... <laughs> sorry. Got the visual picture in my head. He was wearing 100% scuba gear, a, white, a wetsuit. He's got the flippers on. He's got the tank on, the goggles, everything. Walked right in the living room and sat down on the couch. Didn't say a word to anybody. Boy, he got the attention then, didn't he? Sometimes I think we think about the Holy Spirit and go, boy, that's just a weird uncle. We don't know what to do with that guy. You guys know that before I came here to Kanoi, I worked at a, a camp at a conference center called Kembrook. I was the executive director there. Before I was executive director, I was on summer staff as the program director, as a counselor. And before I was one of those, I was a camper. I started going there when I was about nine. All right? Now, something happens when you make the jump from being a camper to being a summer staffer, suddenly you're kind of like the curtain pulls back and you, you start to interact with people that you looked up to. They were my counselor. They're so cool. They must be 20 years older than me, right? I'm just a little kid to them. You know, they're only like two years older than you. But they start telling you all these things. And one of the things you find out is that there are certain kids that when their name comes up on the camper list, the summer staffers get that list for their cabin and they go, oh boy. Oh got that Brent. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a week, right? And one of the things, <laughs> one of the things I found out was that I was one of those kids. <laughs> I found out, I mean, I was the quintessential bounce off the wall, hyperactive, struggled to listen, struggled to take direction, was always louder than I thought I was being, was always trying to make people laugh. I was the kid that when counselors got my name, they went, oh boy, I don't know what we're going to do with him. I don't, This is going to be a heck of a week, right? I mean, folks didn't know what to do with me. I know they cared about me. I know they loved me. One of the counselors at that camp led me to know Jesus. I know they cared about me, but they didn't know what to do with me. For us, the Holy Spirit is often like that. I care about the Holy Spirit. I care deeply about the Holy Spirit, but I just don't always know what to do with that whole Holy Spirit thing. You guys know that I like to ride motorcycle. Sometimes I'll go away, I'll be missing for a Sunday or two, and it's because I'm somewhere riding motorcycle. I love riding motorcycle. Um, a few years ago, I went out for kind of the last ride of the season. It was probably in November. It was getting cold, colder than I like to ride motorcycle, and I must have filled my gas tank up, not really thinking about it, and I put the bike away for the winter. Didn't think about it. And then spring comes. It gets warm out. Oh, perfect day for a ride. Kids are taking a nap. Let's get out there and ride. And I go out get the bike out, and I hit the start button, and it's just, jun, 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 jun. It won't really kick over. I can't figure out why. What's going on? Did I do something wrong? Not realizing that I, I, I didn't put any stabilizer in the gas tank. And for those of you who don't know, gas can go bad. If it sits in your tank long enough, and you don't use it, no longer is it as combustible as it once was. It won't actually fire your engine. I didn't have good gas. I let it sit there for too long. So I had to drain the tank completely. In some ways, hit rock bottom. Drain the tank, it's empty. I had to drive to the store. I get a couple gallons of gas, bring it back. Fresh gas goes in the tank, and it starts right up. I'm ready to go riding. But I had that wrong gas. Sometimes, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, when it comes to following Jesus, it's really easy for us to try under our own power and our own might to do everything that we are called to do by God rather than relying on the Holy Spirit. You know, the simple fact of the matter is we're not made to run on that kind of fuel. 
We're not made to run on our own fuel. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. When you and I come to know Jesus, we're made to run on a different kind of fuel suddenly. And if we keep trying to do all that we feel called to do, all that we feel compelled to do, on that old gas, we're going to spit, we're going to sputter. If we manage to get the engine started, it's not going to run great. But when we start to rely on the Holy Spirit, it's like going to the store and getting a whole new bunch of gas. Suddenly it's purring along. And so I want to challenge you this morning, in humility, that we need to stop pushing with all of our own strength, with all of our own might, and we need to start relying on the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a challenge for you, but I also realize that is challenging because I can't stand up here and give you a step one, two, three on how you should rely on the Holy Spirit. I, I can't tell you exactly how that looks. I will tell you that well, I haven't been here for two years yet. It's more like a year and a half. But about two years ago, I was in a different job, and I knew for sure that God was calling me out of that job. I knew for sure that God was calling me to pastoral ministry. But I didn't know where that was going to be. I had no idea. All I knew was that the first step for me, if I was going to rely on what God was calling me to do, was I needed to quit my job. I needed to give my notice there. I needed to step out in faith and trust that what I was hearing from God was right. And so I resigned from my position without knowing where I was going to go, knowing that God was calling me to something else. The next step for me was meeting with our bishop to find out if there's any openings in any churches around. The step after that is then deciding with him, am I a good fit for any of those churches? What do you think? And then it's going through the next process of interviews with church boards. And then eventually people like you get stuck with a person like me, right? <laughs> but it all takes steps, one step at a time. And sometimes following the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that you can look out and you can see this long vision of exactly what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to go. The long vision I could see was God wants me back in pastoral ministry. That's it. Following the step was just my daily bread. All right, God, today, what do you want me to do? All right, God, what's the next step? And it's in faith taking each of those steps. You know, in our culture, and I'll tell you personally, from the perspective of a leadership, I like having a plan. I like knowing what's coming so I can plan around what's coming. That's just how God made me. So taking that one little step at a time, that is hard, hard work. That is part of what we're called to, is taking those steps with the Holy Spirit rather than in our own strength. Kyle Eidelman is a pastor and an author. He wrote the book that our series is based around called Not a Fan. And he tells the story of trying to do all the work under your own power. He says he remembers a time that he went to the the airport with his family. He was carrying a whole bunch of luggage. He's dad, so he's got a couple extra suitcases, but everybody else has a couple extra bags, and they're going down the hallway at the airport. And if you've ever been to an airport, you know in a lot of them, off to one side, there's like a, a, a moving sidewalk. You know what I'm talking about? It's like a conveyor belt. If you walk on that sidewalk, you go like two, three times as fast, right? Well, somehow he missed seeing that completely, but his whole family saw it. So his whole family hops on the moving sidewalk, and there's just right down the hallway, two times speed. Well, he looks over and sees them, and he is trying desperately to manage all of his bags and keep up with them. And he does. He's sweating, and he is keeping up with them. They get to the end of the walkway at the same time, but there's a difference. He's frustrated. He's exhausted. He stubbed his toe. He dropped one of his bags. His family gets there, (laughs) kind of rested and ready to keep going to their gate. See, the thing is, we can try our best to white-knuckle the stuff that God's calling us to, to do with all of our own strength and all of our own might, and you might end up at the end of that walkway at the same time as somebody who is, um, you know, living in the Holy Spirit, but there's going to be a difference in your demeanor. You're going to feel wiped out, burned out. Burnout is a real thing. And it is a real thing among people that go to church. 
because they try to do so much. I'll volunteer here, and I'll volunteer here, and I'll do this, and I'll lead that. And it ends up being the same person or the same people doing that. In church world, there's a rule called the 80-20 rule. You ever heard of that? It means 20% of the people do 80% of the work. That's a real thing. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. It ends up being the same 20% that are always stepping up, raising their hand, and joining in. And if you have the Holy Spirit, and you're doing it out of the right heart and the right motives, that could be a great thing. But if you're doing it out of your own strength, and you're doing it because you want to appear like you have it together, or you want to look good, or you're wearing that mask, or whatever, you name the reason that's not Jesus that you're doing those things, you're going to end up burning out. You're going to end up exhausted. You're going to get to the end of the walkway frustrated. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit. So this morning, I want you to go to Acts chapter 1 with me. If you have your Bibles, open it up to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to give you a little context. When you get there, we're going to go to verse 6, so we're right at the beginning. The context for Acts chapter 1 is that it comes right after Jesus has been resurrected, essentially. So Jesus has done his ministry on earth with his disciples for three years. He is put on trial, and he's beaten. He's crucified. After three days, he rises from the dead. And then he spends 40 days with his disciples, teaching them, praying with them, eating with them, walking around with them. Okay, 40 days. That's where we're at right here when we get to verse 6. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? We're going to pause right there, one verse. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? There's a whole bunch of problems with that. Jesus has been with these disciples for three years. He's been talking about the kingdom, kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He's been sharing his heart with them. He's been teaching them about God. They say they love him. They say they follow him. They watched him crucified and resurrected, and he's with them again. And the question that they ask him here, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Restore. Are you going to restore? Are you going to put back? That's the question. The Romans have come in. They've occupied us. They're beating us. They're killing us. Are you going to put back Israel where it's supposed to be? Give us a king. It's going to rule over us, defeat the Romans. Romans, are you going to put it back? Are you going to restore it, God? But you and I just read a verse that says if anyone's in Christ, then they're a new creation. The question isn't about, is there a new creation, Jesus? The question is, are you going to put back the way it was? We liked the way it was. We were in power then. Are you going to put that back? It's an expectation of an earthly kingdom. Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of heaven the whole time. And they're still expecting an earthly kingdom. Are you going to elevate Israel again? You say, um, are you going to do it at this time? I love that. The timing question. Is this the right time, God? They're expecting it to be done kind of like, boom, it's done. There's not an expectation of what's the hard work that we have to do. What do we need to do? The expectation is the hard work is over. You were killed. You've risen from the dead. That's got to be the hard work, right? So now must be the time. Boom. Restore the kingdom of Israel. Put it all back the way it's supposed to be. And we, your followers, get to sit at your right hand and your left hand and enjoy it, right? That's the expectation. It's kind of like they're shooting at a target. And their hearts are in the right place. But they're shooting at the wrong target. It's kind of like they've come to sit at the feet of Jesus, and they're bringing their questions to the right person, but they're asking the wrong question. Go to verse 7. Jesus kind of corrects their course. He says, He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We'll stop there. Wow. That's a big load to bear if you think about it. Whew. From asking the question, if Jesus is done with all the hard work, and the time is right to get the Romans out and put our king back where they're supposed to be, and Jesus responds, this is a task that could be 
overwhelming. Jerusalem. He says, I'm going to have you go into Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the holy city. Jerusalem is also the place that they just killed Jesus. It's full of Pharisees and Sadducees. We talked about last week. People with a lot of power and a lot of money. They just killed Jesus. And you want us to go back there? You want us to be witnesses to them? Okay. Well, Judea. Well, Judea is all of the countries surrounding Jerusalem. It's where all the rest of the Jews live. The Jews who seemed to really like Jesus when everything was going swell, and then when things got hard, they ran. You want us to go to all of them? Okay. Samaria? Well, guys, we've been talking about Samaria this whole year, about how the Jews and the Samaritans don't get along. They don't like each other. They kill each other. You want us to go to another country where they don't like us, where they might fight with us or hurt us or kill us and be witnesses there? <laughs> Gotta be kidding me. Jesus, really? Oh, by the way, if you keep reading in verse 9, that's the, Moses, the moment that Jesus goes back to heaven. All right? So he says these words, and then he's like, right out of there. Okay? That's the sound it makes. I don't know if you guys know that. When Jesus goes back, it's, right? <laughs> That's like a divine mic drop, right? They think that he's going to do all the hard work and put everything back, and he's like, actually, I want you guys to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, all the way to all the people you don't know, the ends of the earth. I'm out of here. How hard is that? Like, that's a big load to bear if you're bearing it alone, right? Flip with me to John chapter 16, if you can, okay? Okay. John chapter 16. I think we're going to stay in John the rest of the time, so you won't have to go too far from there. The context for John 16 is that Jesus has been talking to the disciples. He's been teaching them. He teaches them about how the world is going to hate them. He said, they hated me. They're going to hate you. He talks about the, the branch and the vine. He says, true life comes when you stay connected to the branch, connected to the vine. And he said, if you don't bear fruit, what's a good gardener supposed to do? Well, they cut off the branch. Um, he talks about how he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. You know, and, and in this, these passages leading up to it, Jesus keeps talking about how he's going to leave. This is always interesting to me about the disciples, is that Jesus is always saying, I'm going to have to go. And yet when he does, they seem surprised. In the Gospels, he's always talking about how he's going to have to die. And yet when it happens, they're surprised, right? It's like they're aware of it. It's just they can't quite comprehend it. And Jesus is saying, too, in in um, in chapter 16, verse 5 and 6, he sort of scolds them a little bit. He's like, I'm always talking about how I'm going to leave. You guys never ask me where I'm going to go. You're just always sad about it. Like, there's, there's more questions to ask. We can press in a little bit further, okay? Now, in verse 7, chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. He says this, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. We'll stop there. How in the world can it be better for Jesus to go away. I mean, think about that, right? How can it be better than that? Jesus is, is God. It's God is with them. How could it be better that Jesus goes away? That doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense. Advent's right around the corner. Christmas is coming. Advent is the time where we celebrate the coming of Jesus. We use the word incarnation, which means God comes down and makes his dwelling place among men. We use the name Emmanuel, God with us. In John 1, 14, it says, the word became human and lived here among us. And that's not the first time we read verses about God being with his people. If we go back into the Old Testament, there's plenty of places there where that absolutely happens. We did a series on Abraham not long ago called The Faithful. If you guys missed that, you can check it out on our website. It's there. But in that series, we talked about how God came and was with Abraham. He walked with him. They had dinner together. God was with him. 
We know that um, when Joseph, one of Abraham's descendants, was in uh, Egypt, in Potiphar's household, it says that God was with him, so he was successful. We know that Isaiah writes that God says, I am with you, I am your God, I will strengthen you, and I will uphold you. I mean, God has been with his people for a long time. How in the world could it possibly be better than God with us? But when we look at Scripture, we see in the Old Testament, God is with us. We get to the Gospels, we read about Jesus, we know that God literally has come down from heaven into the form of man to be with his people, God with us. But when we look after that in the New Testament, we stop seeing references to God with us. It's kind of odd. They just start to disappear. Why is that? Jesus is saying, it's better that I go away. What could be better than God with us? God in us. What's better than God with us? God in us. John chapter 14, verse 15. I might have to go back one page. It says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. Look, we're doing a sermon on the Holy Spirit. In no way, shape, or form am I exhausting the Holy Spirit this morning. I'm not exhausting what we know about the Holy Spirit. We could do sermon after sermon after sermon on the Holy Spirit. We're scratching the surface this morning. Jesus says a lot about the Spirit that he's sending right here. The Spirit of truth who be with you forever. The world cannot accept him and neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. A Spirit that will be in you. A Spirit of truth that the world can't make sense of because they don't understand it. Because someone who doesn't know God doesn't have it. It doesn't make logical sense to them. It's a spirit that you're going to know because you know Jesus. Because it's a reflection of Jesus. It it reflects Jesus to us. You're going to know it because, well, it's going to be in you. Verse 26 says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So this spirit that lives in us has a purpose. It's not just a random spirit that comes down or that's given to us as some kind of gift. It has a purpose, very much a purpose, to remind you of everything that Jesus taught you. So that moment when you are talking with somebody and a verse pops into your head, you're like, why do I know that verse? I haven't thought about that verse since I was in VBS when I was a kid or something. It's the Holy Spirit giving you something that you knew, something that you need in this moment. It says he's going to teach you. He's going to teach you all things. So those moments when you're out hiking somewhere and you come across the top of a mountain and you look out across that mountain and for the first time in a new way, you look out and go, oh my goodness, God is so good and so big and so amazing. There's the Holy Spirit coming to you and letting you know just how awesome God is. He's teaching you something new. The moment you open your Bible and you're in Scripture and you go, man, I never saw that before. Oh my goodness, did you just realize what this says? This is incredible. That's the Holy Spirit opening up the Word of God to you so that you can know Him and understand Him that much better. He is in us, reminding us, teaching us. Now, jump in one more time. Chapter 15, verse 26. It's like one full chapter ahead. He says this, When the Advocate comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, when the Spirit of Truth comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. He will testify about me. I want to just highlight one word in there. Testify. He will testify about me. The Spirit is going to be a witness to who God is in you and to you. There's a word, this word testify, it's the word martorio, all right? We'll put it on the screen for you so you can see it. It literally means to bear witness, give testimony, 
or bear record. The Holy Spirit in you, the Spirit of truth that is in you, is bearing witness to who God is within you. Think about this is like this is like some sci-fi awesome inception sort of stuff. This is good stuff. There is a spirit inside of you that is an incredible reflection of who God is, sent to you by Jesus, and he is bearing witness to you the truth of who God is in you. So those moments that we talked about when you unlock the scripture, when you stand on top of the mountain, when you see God in a whole new way, the spirit is bearing witness to you who God really is. The Spirit is giving testimony. And that would be cool enough if that is where this passage ended. But verse 27 actually goes on and says, and you must also testify. Okay. Bear with me for one more moment. Think of yourself as a bottle. Inside that bottle is the Holy Spirit bearing witness to you who God is and now you have a choice cork the bottle and keep it all inside or also testify let that spirit speak through you as to who God is I know a lot of people that cork the bottle and I have been guilty of corking the bottle I don't bring you sermons because I've got this whole thing figured out when I put together these sermons and bring them to you boy it comes straight to my heart just like it does to you guys There are times that I cork the bottle. We heard from Ed last week. He had turned that dump truck around, right? It would have been real easy for him to cork the bottle and keep on driving. Scott shared this morning about going across the street. How many times have you seen somebody struggling but did nothing about it? It would be really easy to cork that bottle and just go downstairs and watch TV. But instead, you only do something about what you see. I know a lot of us who cork the bottle. I don't want to cork the bottle anymore. And you have a choice. Are you going to testify? Are you going to testify? There's a spirit inside of you that is testifying to you. Are you going to testify? It's the same word. Martorios, it's the same word both times. What does it mean to give your testimony? That's a church word. If you're a new Christian, you maybe didn't hear that before. To give your testimony just means to share what you see God doing in your life. It means to share God at work, which is that new thing we've introduced the last two weeks is somebody coming up and sharing God at work. That's bearing your testimony. What does it mean to witness to somebody? Does it mean having all the right answers or the best arguments out there? Does it mean making sure you got that track in your pocket, you can hand them and walk away and have no relationship? No! Bearing witness to them just means allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through you and bear witness like the Holy Spirit is already bearing witness to you. I have so much respect for my father-in-law. One of those times we were riding a motorcycle, we were riding through the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, we came to this beautiful vista. We got off our bikes, we walked out to the edge just to look and see what we see. And my father-in-law felt, he's like, guys, I just need to pray. And so he just stopped with his son-in-laws and prayed. He bore witness to us. He felt prompted by the Holy Spirit that just, guys, this is so beautiful. We just have to pray. Did he put me on the spot because I'm a pastor? Did he put my brother-in-law on the spot to pray? No, none of that. He just said, I got to pray, guys. And he prayed for us, for our ride, and thanking God for what we were seeing around us. That's bearing witness. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. You have a hope if you know Jesus, if you follow God. I hope that there is a deep hope in your life. And if somebody says, why? Man, in the midst of everything that you're going through, in the midst of of this thing that you're dealing with, when the world feels like it's against you and you still stand in this place and you sing praise to God, what in the world makes you different? Why would you stand up and sing praise when everything's going against you? Because I have hope. And what is the reason for my hope? Be prepared with an answer. That is witnessing. We make it so hard and so complicated, but that's it. 
We have to open ourselves up to the spirit within us that is speaking to us and uncork the bottle. Not with all the right answers. You don't need to have all the right answers, guys. If God wants to give you the right answers, guess what? That Holy Spirit's going to teach you and give it to you. Maybe the thing a person needs to hear when you talk to them is that you don't know. And that is the most beautiful answer they could hear because they've been so tired of answers that never really answer the questions that they have. The best answer they could have is somebody who loves God saying, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Why is that? Guys, we must bear witness. Can you put that word back on the screen again, Mike? I want you to look at that word for a second. Just visually look at that and tell me if that word looks like another word that you know. What word? Martyr. Martyr. And a few weeks ago, we read from a book um, called Jesus Freaks. A couple weeks before that, we sang the song Jesus Freaks, talking about people who have been martyred. You know why that word looks familiar? It's the same word. That's the same root word, martorios and martyr. What is Stephen doing, the apostle Stephen doing in Acts chapter 7 when he is stoned to death? And becomes a martyr. What is he doing? He's witnessing. He's just sharing what God has done. He's sharing what he has seen Jesus do. That's it. He's bearing witness. And so I tell you that not to make you scared this morning. Especially if you are a new Christian. I'm not trying to make you scared this morning. But I want you to understand that there are times in your life that you're going to be called to witness. To let the Spirit speak through you. And it's going to come at a cost. And I would be a terrible pastor if I made you think that there was no cost associated with following Jesus, that there's no cost associated with bearing witness. In some places in the world, boy, it is, it is your life. There are times in this world where we live, in this country, it might be your job or it could be a friendship. But doesn't, isn't that exactly what we've been talking about in this series? It is totally possible that when you follow Jesus, when you are serious about that, that your family... It's going to go, it's like, what what are you doing? I don't understand. I can't be around you. Or like when the disciples dropped their nets and they left their family business, their family probably said, why do you hate us? I don't hate you. I just love Jesus that much. That's why we bear witness. Because we love Jesus that much. When we start talking about some of these hard truths, like the cost of following Jesus, that's where we get to decide what sort of cost we are willing to pay. If you have the chance to meet the favorite, your favorite lead singer of your favorite band that you're a fan of, but it's going to cost you everything to do it, every single penny in your bank account, it's going to cost you your car. It's going to cost you your home. It's going to cost you your friends, and it's going to cost you your family. Is that a price you're willing to pay to meet your favorite lead singer? Well, not if you're just a fan. No way. Maybe you're a follower, and that, that's worth it to you. Well, we should talk about that. But that's what the disciples are doing when they follow Jesus. They're giving everything up. They have no job. Now they're depending on God for any sort of money so they can eat or have shelter over their head at night. They're giving all of it up to follow him. Are you willing to pay the sort of cost or not? Here's, a, here's another example. It's a terrible BIC example, but it's an example nonetheless. If you're sitting at a poker table playing poker, when do you go all in? When do you take all the chips and go all in? When you have all the cards. When you know you got the right cards, when you know that you can win with the cards you have, that's when you go all in. And if you don't think you have the right cards, you don't go all in. Guess what we know? We have the winning hand. We know that the battle is won. The war is won. We have read the last page in the story. God wins. I know that you have the winning hand. But for some reason, so many of us choose not to go all in. So what's stopping you today? Because I know the Spirit's prompting you. I know that the Spirit is speaking to you right now and saying, there is this thing, and this is why. 
There's this thing in your life that doesn't let you go all in, and this is why. So what's stopping you from going all in? These disciples in this conversation in Acts, they have claimed to love Jesus and to follow Jesus. They have claimed to know who he truly is. We believe that you are the Son of God. They have claimed all of those things. And so they say, we're all in. Jesus is now the time when you're going to put back all the things that we like and you've done all the work for us? No, Jesus says. The work isn't done. And I'm not doing it. You are. And I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit who is going to come upon you. And this is the time when you're going to go into Jerusalem. You're going to go into the holy city where the people that killed me are still in power, and you are going to bear witness there. And then you're going to go into Judea to all of the Jews that turn their back on me, and you're going to bear witness there. And then you're going to go to the people that you don't like, the people that are different than you, the people that hate you, and you're going to go bear witness there. And then you're going to go even further than that to the very ends of the earth to people that you don't even know exist right now, and you're going to bear witness there. And guess what? When you go, people are going to follow. They're going to follow me. They're going to know that I sent you because of the way that you love one another and because there's a spirit of God within you. Now is the time that the work begins. Are you in? Are you ready to go all in? Because guys, better than God with you is God in you. Let's fill up our tanks with the right stuff. Are you a follower or are you a fan? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for our time together today and thank you for your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit who often we don't know what to do with. But God, we know that your Holy Spirit isn't a weird uncle that we can ignore or make fun of. Your Holy Spirit is bearing witness inside of us to who you are in our lives. But you've created us not to be a hindrance to the blessing you've given us. You don't want us to be a cork in the bottle. You want us to flow freely. So God, I'm going to pray right now for our congregation that if there is anyone who has this thing in their life that's keeping them from going all in, that they'd be aware of it, that they would know it, and that you would give them the strength that they need to get rid of it. And I'm also going to pray, God, that you uncork our congregation. If there be those among us who feel the Holy Spirit within them, who feels your promptings, who feels like they've been called to do this thing or stop in this place or help this person on the side of the road or that person going to their mailbox, that you would take the stopper in the bottle out and just let the Holy Spirit flow through us. God, if there be any part of us that feels frightened or scared to bear witness to the people around us, Lord, if that Holy Spirit comes knocking on our hearts, don't let us be scared. Don't let us be fearful. Let us go all in because we have the winning hand in you. Sometimes we don't want to trust it. Sometimes we don't want to believe it. So help us, Lord. Help us in our unbelief to rely not on our strength, but on yours. And God, as we do this, help us to be an incredible presence that looks like Jesus in our workplaces, in our families, in our community around us. God, when we have our fall fest in a couple weeks and we invite community members to come to our church, Let us be uncorked in a way that people go, what, that place is different, man. That just, they're so nice. They're so caring. They're so loving. Those people, they bend over backwards for you. I needed this thing and somebody was right there to get it. There was a smiling face to greet me as soon as I came. There was somebody waving to me when I left. Boy, they cared about my kids when they played those games. There's something different about that place and I'm so curious and I just want to know what it is. Maybe I'll go back. God, we pray that you would do work in us and prepare us for moments where we can be you to the people around us. 
on Corpus, God. In your name, amen. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. Do. Cause nothing else can take your place I feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you
attention And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it, when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Stand up.
Yeah. 